Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece again from Central New Mexico Community College. In the previous video, I listed three factors that can impact external respiration. Of those three factors, the first factor um, listed was the partial pressure gradients of the gases along with their solubility. Well, actually, that also applies to internal respiration. But the two other factors that were listed, namely the structure of the respiratory membrane and then ventilation perfusion coupling, those apply to external respiration only. So in this video O, we will take a look at the respiratory membrane again and how it can affect external uh, respiration in the lungs. And we'll learn about ventilation perfusion coupling. Because our gases, that is oxygen and carbon dioxide, must be able to diffuse across our respiratory membrane, it only seems logical that any kind of change in the structure and the size or the surface area, I should say, of the respiratory membrane is therefore going to impact external respiration. So typically, in a healthy situation, the respiratory membrane, remember which is made up of the simple squamous epithelium of our alveolus, and then the simple squamous epithelium of the capillaries surrounding these alveoli, it is pretty thin. It's only a half a, half a micrometer to about a micrometer thick. Remember that the size of a red blood cell, the diameter, is about 7 to 8 micrometers. This is, rather, that, this is like an eighth, if not a sixteenth, the size of that, so quite small. So anything that uh, causes thickening of this respiratory membrane is, of course, going to make it much more difficult for the gases to make it from one area to the other, that is, from, uh, from the alveolus to the capillary or vice versa. The gases would literally have to travel further. Um, and this can happen typically if the lungs become very waterlogged, uh, there's a lot of swelling going on, which we see in, in pneumonia, for instance. But aside from thickening, we can also see issues with the respiratory membrane losing surface area. In a healthy individual, the surface area of a respir respiratory membrane is is gigantic. It's 40 times the size of our skin, and our skin is already huge. So any kind of decrease in the surface area is going to therefore reduce the amount of um, gas exchange space. And we see this happening in people who suffer from emphysema, for instance. So in this slide we see on the right-hand side on the right-hand side here, we see pretty healthy alveoli that are all more or less the same size. But if we take a look to our left, we notice that the alveoli have become very large. Well, what's happened here is that the walls of the, the, the healthy alveoli that you see here have broken down to where we now have just one big alveolus. So compare this, you guys. If we have many small little circles, therefore many healthy alveoli, versus just one big alveolus, the surface area in our healthy individual is much, much higher than in our sick individual, right? If you follow this surface area here and make this three-dimensional in the sick individual where all the walls of the alveoli have fused versus this individual, you can see that the surface area in the healthy individual is significantly bigger. So finally, the third factor that impacts external respiration or gas exchange between the capillaries and the alveoli in the lung is something called ventilation and perfusion coupling. So when we talk about ventilation, remember that's the air that is flowing 
in the respiratory pathway and that actually reaches our alveoli. Perfusion, on the other hand, refers to the flow of blood and, and of the blood that actually reaches the alveoli. When we use the terminology ventilation, perfusion, coupling, we're implying that there is a relationship between how much air reaches the alveoli and how much blood flows to the alveoli. We need to actually have a very nice match between ventilation and perfusion for gas exchange to be efficient and productive. So let's take a look at this. First of all, carbon dioxide is going to affect the flow of air in our lungs. So any changes in the alveolar partial pressure for carbon dioxide is going to cause changes in the bronchioles. On the other hand, oxygen levels are going to affect blood flow. You might recall that perfusion in the lungs works opposite from all the other tissues. In the lungs, if there is a lot of oxygen present in the alveoli, we are going to send the blood to those alveoli to pick up all of that oxygen. On the other hand, if the oxygen levels in the alveoli are low, what's the point of sending blood to these alveoli? There's no oxygen to pick up. Let's send them to other alveoli. Let's send the blood to other alveoli that do have high levels of oxygen. So around those alveoli that have low oxygen levels, we're going to see vasoconstriction. So what do we really mean by ventilation, perfusion, coupling, and how the relationship between ventilation and perfusion is inverse? Well, let's look at a scenario. Let's say that a clump of alveoli have a, has a high uh, level of carbon dioxide, but a low level of oxygen. Remember, oxygen levels are going to especially impact our blood flow. And you know by now that if alveoli have low oxygen levels, we're not going to want to send the blood there. So we vasoconstrict. On the other hand, since carbon dioxide levels are high, we're actually going to bronchodilate because by increasing the airflow, we are going to be able to blow off all of that carbon dioxide and hopefully also bring in some fresh oxygen. We can look at the opposite scenario. Let's say that carbon dioxide levels are low and oxygen levels are high. If oxygen levels are high, let's send the blood there, let's vasodilate and pick up all of that oxygen. At the same time, we're going to see constriction in the bronchi so that we can decrease the airflow because we want to hold on to the carbon dioxide. It's already low as it is. And by the way, this brings up an important thing we're going to see very soon in the future videos, and that is carbon dioxide levels in our respiratory system play a much, much, much more important role than oxygen levels. That might come as a surprise to you, but this will be explained to you very soon. So if our carbon dioxide levels are already low, in our bronchi, we do not want to lose even more carbon dioxide, and so we will bronchoconstrict. Notice in my two scenarios that whatever the blood does, that is perfusion, is opposite to what happens with regards to ventilation. So if bronchodilation occurs, we'll typically see vasoconstriction. On the other hand, if we see bronchoconstriction occur, we typically see vasodilation. This we refer to as ventilation-perfusion coupling. And there's an inverse relationship between airflow and blood flow. And so here we can quickly recap what we did in, the, in this video and the previous video. We looked at factors that affect 
external respiration. We looked at partial pressure gradients as well as, as, well as gas solubilities. And this particular um, factor listed here also applies to internal respiration. The second thing, the second factor we've discussed is the importance of the structure of the respiratory membrane. And finally, we learned how alveolar ventilation and blood perfusion in the lungs are inversely related and they must match each other in order for us to have efficient gas exchange. Now, recall that when we use the term respiration and physiology, it includes four processes. So far, we have finished studying pulmonary ventilation. We just finished studying external respiration. And we've already touched on internal respiration, which is really the opposite of external respiration. But I'll quickly mention it in our next video. And then we have quite a bit of videos that deal with the transport of gases.